we are proud to announce our 12th and final film, The Swan Princess Far Longer Than Forever. The swanderful and touching conclusion to the Swan Princess franchise will be available to digitally stream this September 17th, 2023, and DVDs will be available to purchase on October 24th, 2023. It would appear that I have been summoned. After seven computer-animated reboot-era sequels, including a theoretically impressive five-year run of yearly releases, Swan Princess Partners Utah LLC, the current holders of the intellectual property rights to the Swan Princess trilogy released by Sony Pictures in the 1990s, went suspiciously quiet for just shy of three full years. It does not escape my notice that this times out almost perfectly with my scorching expose on their not-very-good movie and the weird evangelical Mormonism lurking just beneath their surfaces. Coincidence? Almost certainly. But it would seem that Richard Rich and Brian Nissen, the swans themselves, were not falling behind, running late, nor standing still, but were lying in wait. Because in this, the year of our Lord 2023, they released not one, but two additions to the franchise. A fairy tale is born in May, followed by far longer than forever in September, which has been announced to mark the 12th and final film in the series, freeing the creative team to retire from the industry. Which means that my unholy deal inked in my own blood is nearly complete, my soul will be free, and the forbidden arts will be mine at last. This is the end of The Swan Princess. I'm really making it sound like I mean I killed Odette. <laughs> Fine. So, quick reminder of the cast of characters as we know them so far. Odette, our titular swan princess, used to be under a spell where she was a swan most of the time, followed by a brief era where she was frequently getting turned into a swan for one-off reasons. That's solved, now she's just your normal cartoon adult woman. Everybody still calls her a swan princess like that means something. The swan princess. Tomorrow my brother sails to the kingdom of the swan princess. We'll storm the castle and put an end to the swan princess. You are making a gift of fireworks for the swan. Princess. This year it's a Swan Princess Christmas. Used to be a super spunky and hilariously spiteful character. These days her most definitive personality trait is thinking rats are gross. Prince Derek married to Odette. They did the enemies to lovers thing where they spent their childhood knowing they were supposed to get married, hated each other, came out the other side of puberty deciding this was cool. Derek beefed it. You're beautiful. Thank you. But what else? What else is there? You should write a book. How to offend women in five syllables or less. But made up for it by making a vow of everlasting love that broke Odette's curse. He's stabilized into sort of a highly capable doofus, like split the difference exactly between your prototypical Prince Charming and just Ken. Queen Uberta, Derek's mother, widow, frequent hostess of over-the-top parties, lover of all things frilly, general girl boss, and occasional prosperity gospel preacher who derails entire eras of my life. Lord Rogers, a member of Uberta's court, father figure to Derek, frequent hijink rival and on-again, off-again flirtation of Hubertas. King William, Odette's father, widower, died in the original movie, but this one has a significant prequel component, so he's gonna show up. Elise, Odette and Derek's adopted daughter, rebellious streak to rival young Odette's, guess how relevant that's gonna be today? She's a teenager, I think? Lucas, Elise's boyfriend, son of a couple of tulip farmers who had to disown him because they couldn't afford to feed him, so he ran away until Elise convinced him to give them a second chance, and they remembered that humans actually can survive on hugs alone after all. Grew up all hunky-like. Jean Bob, Speed, and Puffin, Odette's friends who are a frog, a turtle, and well, a puffin, respectively. Now that Odette hasn't been a swan for like six movies, they tend to be paired with Rogers for sidekick hijinks. Jean Bob had a thing for a long time where he thought he was a prince who needed a kiss from Odette to restore his human form. He's mostly moved on at this point, but he's still got a bit of a superiority complex. Scully, the ghost of a flying squirrel. I could explain further, but I'm not going to. Chamberlain, Ferdinand, and Bridget, Huberta's steward, cook, and mm. new rule: if the little lady who talks like a caveman can play, let her play. Bridget used to be the assistant of bad guy Rothbart, but now she's reformed and has an ongoing thing with Chamberlain. When last we met our intrepid heroes, Elise and Lucas had emerged from a love triangle as a love uh, line segment. Rogers and Huberta had established a set of secret identities as performers that didn't seem like they'd have much use beyond that movie, but here I am mentioning it. And Derek and Odette were still just Derek and Odette. So, 
We have two movies to cover today, which form a very explicit duology. A Fairy Tale Begins ends with a to be continued, and the first scene of Far Longer Than Forever is a repeat of the last scene from A Fairy Tale Begins. Hey, uh, Laura from the future here. I somehow managed to call A Fairy Tale is Born, A Fairy Tale Begins literally every time I mention it in this video. That was a really clumsy mistake, and I'm super embarrassed about it, but uh, not quite embarrassed enough to reshoot the whole thing. So uh, the movie's called A Fairy Tale is Born. No matter what Laura from the past tries to tell you, may God have mercy on her soul. It's clear that these movies are meant to be viewed more or less as one thing, so I'm mostly going to treat them that way, but I do want to address them as their own things for a second, because there's a pretty stark gulf between the two in terms of quality. A Fairy Tale Begins, which let me also point out is inexplicably styled with a capital T in the middle of the word. Like all one word, no space, but two capital letters. Fascinating. Anyway, A Fairy Tale Begins is one of the worst entries in this entire franchise. It is an aggressive wink and a nod to a handful of things you remember from the original movie, and a toppling overhaul, if not a full retcon of basically all the rest of it. There is so much goddamn plot in this thing that I literally could not take notes fast enough. I tried to write out a proper summary like a good little video essayist, and it took two full pages, single space. It is a rich text, and almost none of it is a good time. Essentially, we have three entire beginning, middle, and end arcs packed in here. First, a younger but physically identical Huberta is crowned queen and proves her chops by way of a dog show. Second, Huberta's husband, King Maximilian, aka Max, tries to convince the fairy tale UN to be less bigoted and gets killed by pirates. Third, 25 years later, Huberta decides to step down as queen so she can inhabit her alter ego, world famous singer Madame Lacroix, full time, and throws Derek and Odette the most memorable coronation of all time. The most memorable coronation of all time. All while teaching Odette her secrets for successful queenhood. And boy howdy does every word of those last three sentences merit unpacking. Strap in. The story picks up with Derek and Odette setting out to investigate the mysterious circumstances of King Max's death in Far Longer Than Forever, which somehow manages to emerge from those ashes with 45 of the best minutes of Swan Princess content this side of hand-drawn animation. There is a sequence in here that actually pulled me along and made me laugh 100% genuinely. And honestly, that's as good a place as any to kick this all off. We are all adults here, and nobody can tell us not to eat dessert first, you know? So Derek and Odette are conducting an investigation while undercover as a pair of magicians calling themselves the Barrymores and have holed up in a local hotel. Which means Odette gets to rock wide-legged pants again, which I love. They call Rogers for backup, and he shows up in disguise and claims to be their manager, but he doesn't know which room they're staying in. The innkeeper, who we've established at this point is a notorious gossip, says she'll tell him if he gives her some juicy insider deets on the apparent celebrities living under her roof. You give me something about the Barrymores, <laughs> and I'll give you the room number. Rogers starts tossing out a list of the most scandalous ideas he can come up with. He's a flirt and she has a gambling problem. He's a thief. She has a wooden leg. He wears a toupee. Room number. Until Derek and Odette stroll into the lobby, meaning Rogers doesn't need their room number anymore. The innkeeper follows up on some of Rogers' story. Hmm, your hair looks real to me. And Derek sets the record straight for the local gossips. Hey Francine, I'm not bald and my wife doesn't gamble. The pacing of this whole sequence is absolutely on point, the voice acting is delightful, and the characterization of Derek being so sensitive that he can't handle the idea of strangers thinking his non-existent alter ego is bald and married to a gambling addict is extremely charming. I don't know, it's just been so long since we've seen either of these characters have a genuine flaw that isn't just like the straights not being okay, that this like really, really works for me. This is definitely a high point of the movie, but for the most part it's also indicative of the vibe. It's a genuinely fun time. But you may have noticed I said this was a great 45 minutes of Swan Princess content when the movie is an hour and 20 long. Because let me tell you, this thing goes off the rails and I could not have made it weirder if I tried. Strap in. And with that, let us take a full on swan dive into this vat of toxic waste. What does it take to be a queen? It's 
company best if we stop with the basics. So this is our main theme in uh, one and a half of the four plot lines here. Young Uberta is super new at this because she's just been living quietly in a cabin in the woods with her prematurely gray hair and her hunky husband until it turned out that she was the deceased king's closest living relative, I guess. As your grand uncle, through my fourth wife, thrice removed, who you once met at Food Bazaar when you were three, you are now the queen. But thankfully, she has a new friend named Aubrey, soon to be Odette's mother, to show her the ropes, and her husband Max to talk her up when her confidence flags. If you saw what I see, you know exactly what they mean. You will be the queen of queens. After Max's death, she feels like she can't go on. She is so sad, her sadness literally sucks all the color out of the movie. And King Ivan, who we'll hear more from in a bit, shows up to ask Uberta to take Max's seat on the Council of Crowns. What the fuck is a Council of Crowns? Ten crowns, working together to spread good and protect one another. Right. That. This is more or less the only real work of governing we see happen in this whole franchise. They actually have to talk about what to do about, like, a crime wave and the raid that the pirates are planning, which is a thing they, like, announce, apparently. Uberta was supposed to sit on the council when she was first coronated, but she decided she didn't feel like it. Can I push this off on him? Indeed you may. So it kind of seems like this could be her journey of gaining self-confidence, right? You must become the queen he knew you could be. She's gonna step into her power and take her place doing the work and stuff. I cannot join the council, dear Ivan. I have a kingdom to run, a king to raise, and a queen to become. Okay, so no on that. So if Uberta is too busy becoming a queen to, you know, govern, then what the heck does it mean to be a queen in this universe? What does a queen do? The whole palace staff sings Uberta a song about it, which is like a pretty decent piece of music, honestly. Do what it takes to be a queen. You must keep up with every royal plate full. But in terms of like telling us what it actually takes to be a queen, it's uh, vague. Like I think we got more actionable details way back in Princesses on Parade, honestly. She plays croquet and harpsichord and sews her own clothes. But in the middle of the song, Uberta goes to a royal tea with all the kings and queens. What a goofy little political structure we've got here. And we meet the queen of Wixom. She's the worst. She abuses her husband. Husband. That's not even like, that's not me putting that on the movie. It's not subtext, it is just text. As king, it would be nice if I could at least say a few words. Here's a few you can say right now. My wife will do the talking. No more words for you. Sound effects only. <laughs> this movie is ostensibly for children. Sure. So at this tea, the terrible Queen of Wixom is very quick to tell everyone about her cause, which is pedigreed dogs. Unclear what about them, just purebred dogs. So Uberta's like, okay, I gotta find my cause. And with Aubrey's help, she settles on shelter dogs. And Wixom is pissed. Aren't dogs Queen Wixom's cause? <gasps> She's not going to like that. But, but, but what about all the unwanted cats? See, like, I truly do not know what to make of this, right? Like, even for this franchise that is so often so bad at jokes, it doesn't really have the cadence of a poorly executed and reprehensible joke. But it's also not taken particularly seriously in the kind of way that would establish her as, like, a villain villain. It's just kind of a fact of their marriage. What a weird choice. Anyway, she's pissed, and she challenges Uberta to a dog show to determine once and for all whether mangy mutts can keep up with perfect purebreds. Uberta adopts three dogs who she names this, that, and the other, and causes an unseen voice to sing a song about who rescued who, you know? Hug a dog in your arms, set them free. And she enlists Rogers to train them by dressing up like a dog and establishing himself as the alpha. And the dog show happens and the mutts win by a hair because one of the poodles gets stuck under a falling hurdle and the mutts help her out. So she hangs back and lets them beat her to say thank you, I guess. Yep, we're, we're here. 
I knew what I was in for. I signed up for this. You're welcome. The dog show song does go pretty hard though. Boys and beauty at the royal dog show. Grace and beauty at the royal dog show. So the whole kingdom gets psyched about shelter dogs and they all get adopted. And the last family in the door is all sad that there are no more dogs for them to adopt. So Uberta gives them this, that, and the other so we can return to our baseline continuity and not open any plot holes about Uberta not having dogs in any of the other movies, I guess. And she's really Really sad about it, so Max gets her a set of stuffed animals who look just like them. Point of all of this being, okay, so we've established charitable work. That's a thing queens do. Or, you know, stuff that passes for charitable work to literal children. All right, we can work with that. What else? The most memorable coronation of all time. Queens throw parties. Got it. Uberta takes this as an opportunity to pass on her lifetime of wisdom to Odette in a song that is, uh, bad. If they say stop, you say Rogers, you have a challenge, I know. It essentially boils down to your staff are capable of incredible things, but only if you steamroll over their boundaries and demand they work crunch hours. Side note, uh, the first encounter in this song is with Chamberlain, who seems utterly flustered that his boss has burst into his design studio to find him hard at work on a mannequin wrapped up in rope. That's more than I needed to know about his marriage. I mean, good for them, but I didn't need to know that. Oh yeah, Chamberlain and Bridget got married. That happens off screen and it doesn't affect the plot at all, but you can read about it in Odette's Diary in the Schomburg Daily, which is a monthly newsletter available on swanprincessseries.com. Anyway, Odette is sort of like, I don't know about this. Kind of seems like maybe this is a great way to burn everybody out. I worry that some people, that everyone, might get a little, a lot discouraged. So she sings a song to her mother's ghost about it, and her mother's ghost is like, look for another side of the story. And apparently that makes sense to Odette. It's so true. And then Coronation Day comes around and everyone did it. They all crunched and they succeeded and they're so happy. They have this huge sense of accomplishment. Oh look, the other side to the story is that Uberta is always right. Another side of the story. My takeaway from all of this is, of course, that Swan Lake's nonprofit sector was robbed when this woman became queen. The last artifact I will present in Re the Role of Queendom is misogyny on the Council of Crowns. Now, important, it does not seem like there are any institutional barriers to queens sitting on the council. Max only takes Uberta's seat because she'd rather be challenged to a dog show. King Ivan says he inherited his seat from his mother, and there are a number of definitely femme-coded characters sitting silently around the table, basically the entire council aside from the ones with names. This is so interesting to me because the movie is working like really hard to tell us that women definitely, absolutely, 100% are possessed of political power in this universe. You know, the doctor was a woman. Oh, -ho! but as it relates to the actual characters who we have any chance to get invested in, they just don't entirely by default in a way that is indicative of some underlying assumptions that never get challenged. Like if you wanted to make some sort of trad wife feminist statement, there's plenty of room to be like really, really clear that Uberta is choosing this more first lady version of queendom because she likes hosting parties. Why are you trying to take away this woman's right to choose? But the movie doesn't even really do that. And William is on the council and Aubrey isn't, and that arrangement literally never gets mentioned. Same with Wixom and her husband, even though she's the one we hear about by her title and he's just, I don't know, some guy. And in Far Longer Than Forever, we see Derek take his father's seat on the council that's been sitting vacant since Max's death, apparently. And there's no discussion about whether Odette maybe could or should take it. And it doesn't seem like she's taken her father's seat either. Like she goes to the council meetings with Derek, but everyone treats her like she's just sort of along for the ride. There's an attempt at the aesthetic of equality, but there's absolutely nothing going on under the hood. The only thing I've ever stitched was my own busted skull once or twice, and the only hungry mouths I'll ever fill are the sharks. And even in this, you know, theoretically girl-bossed political structure, there is a vocal minority at the time of Uberta's coronation who find it very important to express that a queen's place is in the castle. And I in turn invite my wife to say a few words. If Sebastian wanted her to speak, he would have asked her. 
I, I was just about to say the same thing. In fact, the Council of Crowns appears to be composed entirely of Max, who we love, obviously, Odette's dad, who we love, obviously, the king who adopted fucking number nine back in a royal misetery, who we love, obviously, a handful of theoretically extremely wise unnamed queens who only really speak when they're agreeing with these men who we love, obviously, and three raging bigots. So that's gonna be fun. Max's first day on the council, and the bigot contingent are ready to finally crack down on crime. We need to catch and jail every one of those thieving barbarians. King Max isn't down with that. My father came from these people, and I never once saw him bring an axe to the dinner table. So, like, is barbarian an ethnic group? Is it a slur? Barbarians. It would be better if we called them what they really are. Hungry people who just need work. His father was raised by thieves? I have no idea how to parse this. But apparently the thieving barbarians are an organized enough group that Max brokering a deal between two of his cousins and one farmer, that if the farmer hires these two hungry people who just need work, then they'll stop stealing, fixes it for the whole region. And the council is so impressed that when the current chair says he's stepping down, he nominates Max, the most junior member of the council, to take his place. And the first big issue for this dude who has been in government for all of about 30 seconds is that the pirates are planning a raid, which is a thing they, like, announce, apparently. The bigots want to attack them proactively, Max wants to at least attempt diplomacy, tempers are running high, and they decide to let everybody cool off and hold a vote in the morning. By the time they reconvene, Max has apparently sailed out, the pirates swoop through the harbor and fire their cannons at nothing. Was this just a warning? Or a celebration. And Rogers and King Ivan, who is sort of like the least offensive of the bigot coalition, which you can tell because he was sort of nice to Max one time, recover Max's diary stating that he was so committed to at least trying to work this conflict out peacefully that he went ahead without the council's okay. So, all right. Quick recap. So far in this movie, we have Uberta proving that overlooked mutts can outcompete pedigreed poodles, specifically through the power of kindness. Max working out a conflict through compassionately providing opportunities to people who have been overlooked, thus earning the council's respect. And Uberta teaching Odette that people are capable of incredible things when you make it clear that you believe in them. So it seems pretty clear that, like, Max's insistence on peace talks with the pirates. That's a good thing, right? This is exactly in line with the values that already got him a massive promotion. It makes perfect sense with him and Uberta being these country bumpkins who have shaken things up with their love for the outcast. William, the only non-bigot on the council who is permitted to speak, is pretty sure Max has the votes. I mean, the bigots are even more anti-pirate than they are anti-barbarian, but they're obviously fucking bigots. This is a martyrdom, right? Max did the right thing, and the land is safe from the pirates for the time being, and it's tragic, but he died a hero's death. I cannot overemphasize how clearly we have been primed to see this as a good thing. So naturally, the entire plot of Far Longer Than Forever is about what a shameful thing it would have been for Max to try to make a deal with the pirates at all and how the diary must have been forged. Your father was accused of trying to make a deal with pirates. No, he negotiated with pirates. To tarnish Max's image for one misstep benefits no one. How could the council be so sure my father wanted to negotiate with pirates? There must have been some reason they thought that. No, he didn't. Look, it's a forgery. So yeah, it turns out that Ivan, the bigot who is maybe less bigoted than the other bigots, is the one who made a deal with the pirates to make it look like Max made a deal with the pirates because Ivan wanted to be the chair of the council like his mother before him, so he needed to get Max out of the way and, I guess, tarnish his reputation so thoroughly that nobody would look into it too closely? No, he negotiated with pirates. Derek and Odette and Rogers and the animals uncover this plot through a lot of shenanigans that range from absolute nonsense to actually really fun. There's a red herring where the biggest bigot of the bigot contingent looks really suspicious. Let's say someone wanted to make something disappear, so no one would ask any questions about it. 
How would one go about that? And Speed and Jean Bob go undercover as Huberta's dogs to investigate. No one will suspect dogs of spying. You know who else they'd never suspect? A frog! And Speed negs Jean Bob into grabbing this very scary looking letter he's been writing that seems to be sharing intel with pirates. A merchant ship, heavy with riches, will pass in two days. But then it turns out that he just writes adventure novels in his spare time. Edgar Rex? Mm-hmm. My pen name. Here's my next one. The Pirate Magician, I'll call it. And I guess that also redeems him of being a bigot. Derek and Odette are undercover as magicians this whole time because when they started poking around at the council, Remax's death, someone sabotaged their carriage. Someone loosened it so it would come off right away. Just to send us a message. Message? Don't even think about investigating your father's death. So they gotta keep a low profile, but the gossipy innkeeper overhears them at one point and spills their secret identities. And I guess pretending to be a magician is conduct unbecoming of the Council of Crowns. So Derek and Odette in disguise do a performance for the council that looks exactly like the kind of thing little kids would put together if they were having their Barbie dolls do a magic show. And the whole time they're singing this song about like, do you think royalty could do this? Imagine queen. From a hat, it's sure to lack a certain showman style. It takes a while to get going, but it's kind of a banger. When you're staring at impossible, face to face with the incredible, does it come as a surprise when you just believe your eyes? Also, I'm probably the only one who cares about this, but most of the time when they're singing together, Derek sings the melody and Odette takes the lower harmony line. When you just which you never hear in soprano tenor prince princess duets. Let me share this whole new world with you. All at once, everything is different. And with your love, I'll never be alone. Like, I can't believe I'm saying this about a Swan Princess reboot sequel, but it's honestly a really subtle and smart artistic choice to make for a song where these characters are in disguise. A Swan Princess on alto? Come now! And at the end, someone who is obviously Prince Derek walks in, while not Derek Barrymore is still standing on top of the table. And quote unquote Prince Derek turns out to be Rogers in a full Mission Impossible style mask. And then they track down this accountant who they think could give them information because they heard he used to be a pirate, and he denies it, but he's covered with incriminating tattoos. I don't know who you're talking about. It's him! And Derek and Odette are having the time of their lives with their secret identities on top of secret identities. My name is Mr. Smith, and this is Mrs. Smith. And that's Smith with a Y. Right. So you can tell right there, it's definitely not a made-up name. And Roger sneaks into the council to get Max's forged diary from the archives, and he gets into the building by matching his rope swing to when these NPC guards turn around, and when the archivist leaves to go to the bathroom, Rogers props the door open so he can sneak in behind him, and he says click out loud so the archivist on his way out won't get suspicious. <laughs> And it's just, honestly, this is all looking really charming until Derek and Odette go undercover again as pirates who want to join up with the notorious Captain Firebeard and surprise, he's a bigot. I'd walk the plank myself before I took on a girl pirate. So Odette wins him over by putting makeup on him. It's so fucking hilarious. Hmm. They finally unravel this whole plot. The animals give King Ivan a spooky vision and he confesses and the council hears it all. Confess your crimes. Yes, yes, I did it all. <laughs> I had Max kidnapped and sent to unscapable island. And Derek sets out to rescue his father because now that we know he didn't try to make a deal with the pirates, we know he really was a good person all along. He would never have taken action outside the system when the system failed to take the action he knew was right. He followed the rules, even when the rules sucked. I feel like I've read a book about that. Don't wanna be a hypocrite, cause they're not hip to it. Don't wanna be a hypocrite. 
all right, yes, I know this is why you're all here. You're expecting some sort of revelation about the Mormon vibes going on. You want the conspiracy board. You came for the expose. And I am so sorry to disappoint, but I have no investigative reporting to add to these movies this time around. There's nothing here that derailed my entire life. There's just some very light vibes. Like, I can't explain it, but there's something very fundamentalist to the letters Uberta and Aubrey exchange when Uberta gets pregnant and feels kind of guilty about her joy when she knows Aubrey hasn't been able to have a kid. I know how long you and William have hoped for a child, my dear Aubrey. So it would crush me to know that my joy has caused you the slightest pain. Your joy is my joy. I cannot wait to hold your child and pray that he or she will call me Auntie A for all of my days. Harmless, but lightly fundy. Same with the whole sequence of Odette's birth followed by Aubrey's death and Uberta comforting the now widowed William. There's something about this like off-puttingly honest portrayal of childbirth in a cartoon for little children that is kind of very in line with a certain flavor of Christianity. I'm gonna be super upfront that this is not something I have personal experience with. I'm definitely describing the vibe as an outsider. So please take me with a large number of grains of salt and to any anyone who has more first-hand experience with this culture, I am genuinely so sorry for anything I've misrepresented. But in Christian spaces where purity culture is a big thing, there can be this thing that happens where it's almost like, well, we have to acknowledge all the gritty details of the transgressions that'll get you sent to hell because you need to be totally equipped to recognize them so you don't get tricked into thinking it's okay somewhere down the line. And then there's this equal and opposite almost like, fetishization of these transgressions that stop being transgressions as long as they're happening in the context of a cishet monogamous marriage. So you get this thing where like youth leaders will spend a shocking amount of time talking up how hot their spouse is to teenagers because it's like this stuff you want for these fleshy reasons, you can have it. You just have to do it in the right way. I have a pretty good handle on talking about sex and sexuality with the boys and, and being able to say, hey man, your sexuality is a gift and uh, you should celebrate it and you should have as much sex as you possibly can and yada, yada, yada. Just make sure you're doing it within God's parameters and yada, yada, yada. Um, but with the girls, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's something I, I sit and think about because I'm like, well, shit, man, I don't... <laughs> It's like, wouldn't you say the exact same thing to the girls? But it's just weird because I come from an evangelical mm -hmm. background and feminine sexuality was not not celebrated in evangelicalism. Nope. And you get girls specifically being encouraged to sort of take all this romantic longing that they're socialized to feel and channel it toward Jesus in a way that can get a little bit well, so heaven meets earth like a sloppy wet kiss. I feel like it's worth mentioning, just like log in my own eye wise, that the approach of the more theologically progressive tradition I grew up in isn't necessarily better in terms of like not giving people complexes. Like, purity culture is not really the official stance of my church as an organization, which Full disclosure, I think is good and correct. And as an adult, I've had a lot of really interesting and meaningful conversations with people of my faith about like, well, if hard and fast saving it for marriage isn't it for us, then like, what is? How do we think about the role of sex in a Christian life? What does sex that is of God look like if you expand your definition out past, well, it's whatever one man and one woman in holy matrimony. But this is kind of a seriously uphill battle in terms of making that stance proactively clear, especially to young people whose parents are also part of the church in a culture that is so puritanical about sex and defaults to seeing the Christian church as the seat of morality without any specificity about the vast number of varieties of Christian churches out there. So the vibe as I experienced it was like, somewhere around tweenagerhood, you probably picked up from somewhere other than our church specifically that Christians think premarital sex is a sin. And well, you were a Christian, so case closed. 
And it's not like anyone was gonna tell us teenagers that we were wrong about that, because it only takes one kid coming home from youth group and telling their parents that their cool youth pastor said that premarital sex is okay, actually, to have a full-blown riot on your hands. And so the effective stance of the church actually still came out being like, uh, sure. Purity culture, why not? Just until you age into the 20s, 30s group, you know? We'll fix it then, how bad could that be? Well, in my case, it took exactly one event led by one youth leader who harbored much more conservative beliefs than the organization that employed her that wouldn't become known to the parish until she bombastically quit and mailed a letter to the home addresses of everyone in the congregation informing us that she would no longer be associating with our church following the election and consecration of an out gay man in a diocese that wasn't even in our state to scare the living daylights out of me with something that no one ever bothered to tell me wasn't even something my church believed. That seriously fucked me up, and my church is not innocent in that. It doesn't matter how progressive our values are if we're too squeamish to talk about them when our communities are at their most formative. We've got to do better. Anyway, the point of all of this is, there can be this paradoxical thing where sometimes the Christian denominations that are the most theologically puritanical are also the ones that are the most willing to talk about and even kind of obsess over the gory, anatomically correct details. Childbirth is not itself sexual, obviously, and there's no acknowledgement of sex in the way this movie portrays pregnancy, but there's something about hearing Aubrey groaning in totally unflinching labor pain for like multiple minutes in a movie for tiny babies that kind of tracks. <sighs> Jeez, I hope I never have a baby. Well, I, um, yes, me too. Is Odette's dad a turf? There's also a sense of humor here that's really hard not to compare to Golden Age Veggie Tales. Like a former pirate disguising himself as an accountant but having his sordid past revealed by a series of more and more incriminating tattoos is an extremely big idea move. Settling a political conflict by challenging a rival queen to a dog show has big Phil Vischer energy. Puppies are cuddly, puppies are cute. What am I going to do with all those dogs? Next! But the Swan Princess crew just kind of lacks the panache to stick the landing. Nothing embodies this gap between intention and execution better than naming the place where Max is stranded unscapable island while playing it dead straight. We both heard Roger say it. No one has ever returned from unscapable island. I say the punishment should be banishment to the island of perpetual diggling. Ah! I promise I've seen Veggie Tales other than Esther. This was just the one my family owned on VHS, so it's the one that's burned into my brain at a moment's notice. Why is there a piano on my cake? I'm also gonna throw it out there for those in the know. Scully is not, not basically Chatter the Chipmunk. I want to follow, follow Jesus, for I know he loves me so. But the biggest what the fuck here is this through line of the idea of the queen of queens. That's what Max calls Uberta when her confidence is flagging. You will Queens. Wixom uses it as a way to accuse her of being all high and mighty. She thinks she's the queen of queens! And when Wixom successfully sabotages Derek and Odette's coronation, and Odette has to give this giant monologue about how, yes, this was an unmitigated disaster, and yes, that does reflect pretty poorly on the woman who made this her last act as queen, but we shouldn't hold that against her because she's a great person who's done lots of other things that didn't turn out as unmitigated disasters. And there's a montage with the actual animation from the first movie, even though it's missing an entire dimension in this context, it all leads up to Odette calling her the Queen of Queens. She is Uberta, the Queen of Queens. And Uberta's like, no, you're the Queen of Queens. Thank you, Odette. But it is you, not me, who is the true Queen of Queens. I present to you King Derek and Queen Queen Odette, the true queen of 
queens. And this is just, there's no explanation for what the fuck anybody means by this or why multiple characters all settle on this exact same, honestly pretty clunky wording for the idea of being good at your job, except that, um, Jesus. Jesus is king of kings. That's a pretty common way to refer to him. It's like in the Bible and shit. Huberta is basically the Christ, apparently, is what I'm saying. There's a lot of nonsense in these movies that didn't fit in anywhere else, so I'm dumping it all here. One, the lip thing. When Huberta announces that she wants to throw Derek and Odette a blowout coronation, Derek pushes back that they kind of wanted to do something simple, and Huberta does the lip thing that she does in the original movie as a way to get her way. Please, mother, <laughs> don't do the lip thing. And this update is the single most cursed animation in this entire franchise. Two, Jean Bob's fancy castle pants. When the animals get word that Derek and Odette are moving up in the world, Jean Bob declares that he should get to ride their coattails. I should at least get a fancy title and a pair of pants. Unironically, love that for him. He does an original trilogy style hijink to go get himself a pair of fancy castle pants and gets thrown out of a window via an act of flirtation between two servants we have never met before, which fulfills this duology's obligation to be weirdly horny as is the franchise's want. Stepping down, do you hear? Three. Aubrey. Listen, I could roll with Odette and Derek's daughter being named Elise with an A. It's a little off in a world of Odette's and Uberta's, but she's a new generation or whatever. I don't know. It's fine. But Odette's mother being named Aubrey? Aubrey with an I? They're very specific about that. She has a pumpkin spice influencer ass name. You know what? Those were the real fundy vibes all along. Four. Are talking animals normal in this universe? I thought you were a flying dog. <laughs> Nothing of the sort. Just a seabird in a dog costume who's come to talk to you like a man. Well, that's, that's pretty weird, too. Reply Hazy. Try again. Five, the Queen of Wixom. This isn't, I, I don't really have anything huge to say about her, but I feel like I haven't properly acknowledged what a huge part of these movies she plays. So just for completionism's sake. So Uberto's mutts trounce Wixom's poodles in the royal dog show, solidifying this rivalry. And then after the time jump, Uberta, in disguise as Madame Lacroix, gets mobbed by her biggest fan, who turns out to be her old rival, the Queen of Wixom. She wants Madame Lacroix to sign her arm in permanent ink, and so Uberta, petty queen as ever, signs her real name, and Wixom is humiliated! So she goes with her child servant to get it removed by a tattoo artist who just draws a giant X over it, which is extremely cute, honestly. So then she decides to sabotage the coronation in retaliation, and she goes to the pound that Uberta championed way back in the day and brings all the mutts to the coronation so they'll howl and ruin the music because apparently she learned nothing from the royal dog show, so her plan is foiled when the guys who work at the pound show up and conduct the shelter dogs so they howl perfectly in tune with the orchestra. Queen Uberta says there are no mutts. They're all good dogs. But she has a bunch of other sabotage up her sleeve and that all works, except that Odette gives her moving speech so Uberta's reputation is intact. So in Far Longer Than Forever, Wixom goes to this painter who has also been a pretty big player in the duology since Max saw him living on the street and hired him on as the royal portraitist, and Wixom commissions him to paint a perfect picture commemorating Uberta's humiliation at the terrible coronation. But when he reveals the final product to both queens, it turns out he had a scheme of his own and he painted a gorgeous scene of the most memorable coronation of all time going off without a hitch. You gave me what I didn't get that day. And Uberta is so thankful and she and Wixom decide to set aside their differences and be friends. Yay! I should have been the one to apologize first. I'm so glad we're going to be friends. I think I'd like that. No evidence that she stops abusing her husband, though. Not yay. Six, a pirate today. When Odette and Derek are getting ready to go undercover as pirates, Derek declares that he's gonna do this one alone because a pirate ship is no place for a queen, and Odette retorts, I'll be a queen tomorrow but a pirate today. Which is, you know, a very cute reference because that's what her daughter sang a whole song about back in like movie number six. I'll be a princess tomorrow, but a pirate today. Which means this is the precise moment that familiar viewers will look around and say, hey, where the heck is Elise? Yeah, she's just not in this movie at all. We ran into her and Lucas briefly back in A Fairy Tale Begins when Uberta wanted them to crown Odette and Derek at their coronation and declared Lucas to be a prince, like 
formally, legally, which is apparently a thing she can do, but they've fucked off for the entirety of Far Longer Than Forever, and they just don't come back. Now, to an extent, this is very in line with the last several movies of this reboot. They tend to come in pairs, where you get an Elise and Lucas movie, and then an Odette and Derek movie, which, I mean, A Fairy Tale Begins is a Uberta movie more than an Elise and Lucas movie, but still, it's not that weird to see one couple or the other make themselves scarce for more or less an entire installment. So like, it's kind of a bummer that Derek and Odette don't consult their pirate-obsessed daughter when they need to do pirate things, and it's weird that the filmmakers would draw attention to that without actually doing anything about it, but that's more or less extremely in line with how this franchise handles its continuity. Except, this isn't just any Odette and Derek movie that comes after just any Elise and Lucas movie, this is the swanderful and touching conclusion to the Swan Princess franchise. And there's there's an entire set of major characters missing? I'm sorry, what? Far longer than So yeah, this is the last movie in a franchise that has technically been running for just shy of 30 years, which means its ending is maybe a little bit more than usually important. So what the fuck happens? Derek goes off to Unscapable Island to track down his father who's been missing for over 25 years. It's like super spooky and for a second it looks like Derek is gonna die. But then we hear a little echo of Far Longer Than Forever and Max saves him. Father and son are reunited, they hug, and their familial love transforms the island from unscapable to just a normal island. They fast travel back to the kingdom. I wish I'd looked better for your mother. Where they're reunited with everybody. My birdie. As pretty as the day we met. This is Odette, my queen. My love. My swan princess. That doesn't mean anything to him, you doof. You're gonna have to actually tell him the whole story. They don't get the Schomburg daily on Unscapable Island. Anyway, yeah, reunited with Huberta, Odette, Rogers. You have been a companion to my widowed wife. Who's gonna tell him they were engaged? The bigot contingent of the Council of Crowns, Max's barbarian cousins. I'm sorry, his hungry cousins who just needed work. Who have now joined the landed class, yay capitalism. We're landowners now. Thanks to you. The accountant who used to be a pirate, the queen of Wixom, the kingdom in general. And yeah, that's it. No Elise or Lucas. I guess she just didn't feel like meeting her long lost grandfather. And we get the final song of the Swan Princess franchise. So just to recap, this movie is called Far Longer Than Forever, which is the name of a song from the original Swan Princess movie, a beautiful love ballad that was nominated for a Golden Globe, basically the highest honor this franchise has ever achieved, and we're wrapping this movie that is wrapping up the franchise with a song. So obviously, the pirate turned accountant with all the incriminating tattoos sings a song about how great Max is and how happy everybody is that he's home, accompanied by some extremely uncanny random merchants. Yeah, that's the end of the whole story, the whole 12 movie arc. A guy we just met like 45 minutes ago sings a heartfelt song about how much this whole land missed a guy we first heard about one movie ago whose granddaughter was too busy getting a moment of peace and quiet with her boyfriend to even meet. The Council of Crowns welcomes Max back as chair and Odette's hair goes bonkers and the whole family, again minus Elise and Lucas, wanders down the portrait hall and off into the sunset. And for the very last line of the frame, franchise, Jean-Bob, a character who thought he was a prince way back in the 90s but hasn't brought up that storyline in like eight movies, says, I love these people. They're brave. They're funny. They make you proud to be royalty, you know? Never mind. You don't know. And that's the end. That's it. Like, I wish Brian Nissen and Richard Rich a very happy retirement, I guess, but like seriously, just not two fucks to rub together between the two of them. I want to say I'm disappointed, but I really don't know what else we could have expected. <sighs> what did we learn today, Yorick? So true. The age of the swans has ended and I will see them in hell. Merry Christmas. 
So a huge theme of this whole cursed odyssey through this franchise has been just a complete lack of attention to or interest in continuity. It's a huge part of why these movies are so unpleasant and unrewarding to watch. You know, when you're following along with a set of characters for this long, you want to see their hopes and their dreams and their friggin' baseline personality traits go somewhere from installment to installment. So I wanted to take a second to shout out an artist who does just an incredible job of following through on that aspect of his work, even in a medium where there is absolutely no expectation for it, and that is Patrick H. Willems. If you somehow don't know his work already, Patrick is a filmmaker and video essayist who combines both those art forms into something just entirely his own, where each video has a narrative that usually relates to the thing he's analyzing, and all the videos tie together in a big overarching plotline that now has multiple seasons. The the first season finale is a feature-length multiverse movie about an evil coconut trying to take over the world by amassing clout as an influencer. It has musical numbers and a shot-for-shot -shot recreation of the Nicole Kidman AMC speech and uh, my face for literally like two seconds. It is goofy and beautiful and just an incredible example of what happens when an artist with a totally unique voice gets to make the best version of the thing they want to make without needing to fit it into some box imposed from without. The current season is about to culminate in a big 1960s TV style holiday special that is also about Star Wars somehow, and I cannot wait to watch it. I mean, I'm talking to you from the past where it hasn't been released yet, but you, lucky duck in the future, you can watch it right now over on this video's sponsor, Nebula. Nebula is a creator-owned streaming service that makes space for super cool and creative people to make things that wouldn't work out on YouTube and provides resources for us to think way bigger than we could on our own. It's a home for everything from big ambitious projects like Night of the Coconut all the way down to little things like my recent video on the band Ghost that was really hard to fit into a monetizable box on YouTube with the way their copyright system works. You can watch the version that doesn't suck over on Nebula. You can also find all of my videos and the whole catalogs of a bunch of other great creators usually posted early plus a bunch of bonus content from all of us with no ads or sponsor reads ever. When you sign up using my link in the description or by going to nebula.tv slash Laura Crone, you'll get an annual subscription at a 40% discount for a total of $30 for the whole year, which is just $250 a month. And right now, Nebula is offering lifetime memberships where for $300, you'll get access to Nebula forever. To be super upfront, the annual subscription is a better deal money-wise, but the lifetime membership go a long way to help fund those ambitious original projects. Like in 2024, Jesse Gender and Abigail Thorne of Philosophy Tube both have short films coming out that I cannot wait to watch. So if you want to help support banging independent art and also never have to worry about renewing your subscription for literally the rest of your life, get a lifetime membership. You can also give one as a gift. Christmas is in a few days for those of you who celebrate and are watching in real time. Guess what present? doesn't need expensive rush shipping. Or sign yourself up annually. That's great too. Whatever you want. As long as you do it through my link, you'll actually be supporting me directly as well, which is very cool. One last thing about Nebula. Some of you who have been following my channel for a while might already have access to Nebula through the Curiosity Stream bundle, so I want to make sure you know that that bundle is ending. If you renewed your bundle this year, you will still get Nebula for 12 months from your renewal date, but Curiosity Stream has informed us that they don't intend to pay any bundle revenue to Nebula in 2024, even for the accounts that still have access. Supporting independent creators like me has always been a huge part of the pitch for the bundle. So if that's important to you, which if you signed up through me, I'm guessing it is, you should know that the only way to make sure that those independent creators like me get any of your money is by signing up through Nebula directly. If you go to go.nebula.tv slash unbundle, you'll still get that 40% discount, same as a new subscriber signing up through my link. You'll be charged when you sign up, but the clock on your annual subscription won't start until your bundle access ends. Phew, I think that's it. Happy holidays, everyone.
Thank you so much to all of my Patreon patrons, with an extra special thank you to Andreas Evans, Cassandra Barker, Erudatorum, Glenn Sugden, Ilona Concetta, Jimbo, Michelle, Patrick Berenger, Russell Thomas, and Susan Jones. If you'd like to help support my work directly, the best way to do that is by joining these folks over at patreon.com slash laurakrone. I've drank like none of this beer. Sorry to pull the curtain back. (laughs) (coughs) I have a terrible cough and this is really not what's good for me right now, but I I have an image to uphold.